if you could, would you want more power? Well, maybe you should ask first what power we're talking about. There are different powers. The message today, we're going to be talking about some of those contrasting powers, the right power and the wrong power. Everywhere you look today, people are preoccupied with the idea of power. People are crazed by power. I mean, you hear folks talk about, let's together get together for a power lunch. And uh, during lunch, I took a power nap. <laughs> and then I went to the convenience store for a power drink, sometimes known as an energy drink. You may have heard of... Uh, Energy drinks are just one of the phenomenon that have um, skyrocketed in the last few years. And it's interesting, they advertise them as having special ingredients and vitamins and enzymes. And really what it is, it's sugar and caffeine in all these different concoctions. But you take out the sugar and caffeine and people won't buy them anymore. They're just looking for energy, which is another way of saying looking for power. We sort of take power for granted. Some of you remember back in 2003 in the Northeast, I, mean, you, I assume we're not there, but maybe some of you were, when they had the largest power failure in uh, modern history. Now, I was in New York in 1964 when they had the famous blackout. But the one they had in 2003, 50 million people were plunged during a sweltering August, where people use a lot of power for air conditioning, were plunged into darkness that night and all the next day, traffic lights, elevators, everything, just they turned off the lights. We sort of take power for granted. Some of the executives that were in their penthouses, 40 stories up in New York City, with their suits, had to walk down 40 stories of stairs because the elevators didn't work and then walk out onto the streets where there was gridlock because the traffic lights didn't work. And the cell phones didn't work. Some folks began looking for those old-fashioned telephone booths that had not been used for years except by drug dealers. But we take power for granted. A few times here at Central, we've had just the power go out. Especially when you're doing media, you really notice it. We depend on power every day, especially in our world. What's a definition for power? Maybe we should define what it is we're talking about, and then we'll break down some of these two principal powers that are at war in the world. Power. One, I think we may even have a definition that we'll put up there on the screen for you. The ability to do or act, the capability of doing or accomplishing something. Two, political or national control, command or strength, such as in a government or country or state. Three, great strength, might, force. Four, a position over others, such as authority or ascendancy, power. People mostly wish they had more power because we feel kind of powerless. We don't want to be out of control. We wish that we felt we could have a little more security and we don't know what's going to happen one minute from now, whether it has to do with our life and strength and energy or what's going to happen around us or what's going to happen with the economy or what's going to happen with the government or will there be in problems with the natural disasters and sometimes we feel a little bit helpless and if we just had more information, information can be power. Well, I want to turn your attention to a story in the Bible that's going to be a good catalyst for us to study this subject. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Interesting story. Dealing with the subject of power. Tell you what, for the kids... I was listening as uh, Sister Elizabeth was sharing the children's story. I want you to make a note 
every time that you hear me say the word Simon, that would be one. You tell me after the sermon how many times I said the word Simon. That's two now. So get a piece of paper and start counting. I'm giving you advance warning. I was going to use the word power, but there were so many powers behind me already that I didn't give you a fair start. So we'll use the word Simon. That's three. Okay. Now, you know what happened? I just lost half the adults because they're going to be counting. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Little background. Stephen has just been stoned. A couple of deacons were ordained that were filled with the Holy Spirit. One was Stephen and one was Philip. Stephen was stoned. He defends his faith in chapter 7. Saul was an accomplice to his execution at the end of chapter 7. And in chapter 8, a great persecution arises in Jerusalem. And so the disciples are scattered everywhere preaching. And uh, it's where we take up the story. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and he preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord, I'm in Acts chapter 8, verse uh, 6 now, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. But, always a change in the story when you hear that word. There was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is a great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs that were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, of course Peter and John are apostles, Philip was a deacon who later became an evangelist, who when they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They'd been baptized in water, but hadn't yet been baptized in the Spirit. For as yet none, for as yet he, he the Holy Spirit, not it, notice, had fallen upon none of them, for they'd only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands might receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor por portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart might be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray the Lord for me that none of the things that you have spoken of may come upon me. So they testified and preached the word of God in that area. They returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Okay, that's our story. I wanted to read the whole thing. Now that's what we're going to study. This experience where the apostles were preaching, and you've got a battle between the power of God and the power of the devil that are happening here in this story. Now, first I want you to note, Philip, the evangelist, the deacon, who became an evangelist, he went down to Samaria. And that's not by accident. Notice in Acts 1, this was in our memory verse, or the scripture reading rather. Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said, this is red letter, 
You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you so you can speak in tongues wherever you go. Is that what it said? Why did Jesus say he wanted to give the church power? You will receive power to be my witnesses. Why might you want more power in your life? I want more power in my engine. Is there any man here who would not like more power in his engine of his car? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I, I kind of bought for economy because it's less expensive, but then I started to miss my six-cylinder because I downsized to a four-cylinder for economic reasons. I miss my six-cylinder. But I know somebody who's got an eight-cylinder. And when I was in Europe, a man picked me up who had a car with a 12-cylinder engine. And I wasn't happy at all with my four-cylinders anymore. <laughs> I mean, is there anyone, any man here who can't relate to what I'm talking about? Can I get an amen? amen? It's really nice when you put your foot down, all of a sudden your head goes back through the headrest <laughs> on your car. Power. <laughs> but that's not the power we're talking about today, is it? We're not talking about BTUs in our tank or horsepower. We're talking about power to be witnesses. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he gives us a power to represent him. It's not a power to babble incoherently. And I believe in the gift of tongues used rightly. Some people think that's what the power of the Holy Spirit is for, so that you can speak in more languages with more volume. No, it's so that you can be his witnesses. And if you need to learn another language to witness better, then that's part of the Holy Spirit. But the main reason is you'll receive power to be my witnesses. Witnesses where? Notice what Jesus said. In Jerusalem, where was the Holy Spirit poured out? In Jerusalem. And in Judea. And they went from Jerusalem, and you notice they started preaching in Judea. And in Samaria. Isn't that where Philip goes next? They obeyed Jesus. And then the uttermost parts of the earth. They went from Samaria. They were scattered everywhere preaching the gospel. So back to our verse again in Acts chapter 5, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 8, verse 5. So Philip goes down to Samaria and he preaches Christ to them. Now had they met Jesus in Samaria before? So he didn't need to give them as much information about Jesus as they maybe needed to once they got up higher in Asia because Jesus had preached in Samaria. And remember the woman at the well there at Sychar, she went into the town, she told everybody, they all came out, they received Christ. And they said, we believe, not only because of what you said, but we've now met him for ourselves. Philip goes and tells more about who Jesus is. And not only that, he's doing and performing great miracles. And since they heard those things which Philip spoke, they heard the word of God, and then the word of God is then punctuated, endorsed, ratified, seeing the miracles that he did for unclean spirits. Now... That's the devil, isn't it? You all agree? Yes. Crying with a loud voice came out of many. Did sometimes unclean spirits cry out with a loud voice when Jesus was teaching and preaching? They said, we knew who you are, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. Have you come to torment us before the time? They often called out to identify him. And these unclean spirits, they cried out when they came out of these people that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies that had been paralyzed or were lame and sick, they're healed. Can you imagine the joy? They go through these towns in Samaria and Philip's preaching and the devils are cast out and people who are crippled can suddenly walk and people who are paralyzed can suddenly get out of their wheelchairs and move and people who are deaf and dumb can talk and hear and I mean, just incredible miracles. Now, let me just stop at that point for just a moment. Did that power of miracles to that level stay in the New Testament church throughout the New Testament? No. During the ministry of Christ, three and a half years, for at least three and a half, four years, Whenever they entered a new territory, it seemed like God gave them power to perform miracles for a while. The miracles were so the people would believe the word. And once they believed the word, 
Then Christ wanted them to believe without the signs and wonders based on the word. Because, you know, later in the New Testament, you hear Paul saying, I'm sick and I prayed and I'm still sick. And then Paul says, Timothy's sick. And you can find about five or six people that Paul identifies in his letters that were sick, that they needed to pray for. And so these guys didn't walk around like magicians the whole time of their ministry healing everybody. But sometimes there were waves of revival and signs and glory in these towns to launch. It was basically, any of you ever use starting fluid in an old engine? Y'all, men know what I'm talking about starting. It's ether. You spray it into a carburetor. Can't even find a carburetor anymore. But you know, you, you're starting up a Caterpillar engine or something like that. It's like boom, 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 boom. And you take a little of that starting fluid. WD-40 works, by the way. Little squirt, it's just, you know. And the Lord kind of sprayed starter fluid whenever they went to a new flound of town of signs and wonders and miracles to get everybody's attention and hear the word and believe. And that's what was happening. These powers were happening. Well, he comes into a town where there is a very famous individual who uh, had also had a different kind of power. And so you've got basically a conflict of messages and a conflict of power. Now, we all know Jesus' power. The Bible talks about the power of Christ. And uh, the devil has power. I don't want to spend a lot of time bragging about the devil, but you need to be aware. The devil wants to stop the power of God with his power. Because these two powers do not coexist together very well. It's like light and darkness. Any of you ever heard about the, uh, what they call the electronic Armageddon? Electronic Armageddon? Uh, sometimes it's known as an EMP or electromagnetic pulse. Back in 1966, I'm sorry, 62, the United States performed a secret test experiment called Starfish Prime. This is true. It's not conspiracy stuff. In this unique experiment, they detonated a 1.44 megaton thermonuclear warhead 250 miles above the Earth over the Pacific Ocean. They wondered what the effect would be. Well, in Hawaii, 900 miles away, a burglar alarms began to go off telephones stopped working, street lights popped. There were all these very interesting phenomena that happened. And they finally realized what was going on is when these thermonuclear explosions were happening way up in the atmosphere, they sent out gamma rays. And as they passed through the air, they turned into microwaves. And it created a pulse where in a billionth of a second, it was frying electronics all around Hawaii. It didn't reach to California, but it had a very definite effect. Well, they've done a lot of experiments since then, and they've discovered that they can build devices now that create electromagnetic pulse, an EMP, a very powerful explosion of these pulses. And if it's done over a city, it can paralyze a city because it will fry all the circuits and anything that runs on these transistors and, and uh, just Basically, cars would stop running, the power grid would fall apart. It wouldn't hurt people unless you have a pacemaker. But uh, you could basically neutralize a city with one of these electromagnetic pulses, creating sort of an Armageddon electronically in a city. And the governments of the world have a gentleman's agreement that they're not going to do this to each other. We also have the technology where if we want to, we can use lasers to destroy China's satellites. But we don't do it because they can use lasers to destroy ours. Basically silencing all of the communications of the world. Well, there's a war going on between the power of Christ and the power of the devil. And the devil does have some power. I think we all know that. But let me give you some verses. Ephesians 2.2, 2, Paul said, when in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. It's like an electromagnetic pulse in the air. 
the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Ephesians 6, 12, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Luke 4, 6, the devil said unto him, the devil's talking to Jesus, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that's delivered to me and whomever, whomsoever I give it. All right, don't miss that point. Can the devil give power? At least he claims to, doesn't he? Jesus didn't argue with that point. It must be true. Does the devil ever give power? Some people are so desperate for the power, they've sold their souls to the devil. Luke 22:53. Jesus said, I was daily with you in the temple, and you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Not just the power of light, there's a power of darkness. Acts 26, 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. That's what our ministry is as Christians, to turn people from darkness to light and the power of Satan unto God that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance of those that are sanctified by faith in me. These are actually the words of Christ. So Philip is in town and he's preaching and doing miracles and he finds out from the people that they're, he's basically invaded the territory of another very prominent spiritual leader. He is a spiritual leader but a different spirit. And what's his name? Simon. I hope you're counting. Sometimes just to distinguish him from a number of other Simons in the Bible. You know the Old Testament, one of the sons of Jacob was Simeon. And the New Testament derivative of that is Simon. And of course you've got Simon the leper, you've got Simon Peter, you'll find several Simons in the Bible. This one to not be confused is called Simon Magus. And that's not Simon Maggot. It comes from the Greek word that means Magios, which means magician, and uh, or it's actually magion, and it's it means a ma that's where we get the word magician. Someone who exercises the arts of the magi. Now you know the wise men who came looking for Jesus. They were called the magi. That doesn't mean they worship the devil. That means that they came from the Medo-Persian group, all the way back, dating back to the Tower of Babel that um, studied the arts of the sciences. But by the time of the New Testament, it had taken on another meaning, and it's talking about those who practice the magical arts to deceive using sorcery. In effect, Simon, remember he's not an Israelite, he is in Samaria. Samaria did not worship idols like many of the pagans did, but their religion was not totally pure. It was kind of mixed up with the Jewish religion, mixed up with the Assyrian religion, and they worshiped on Mount Gerizim, and it was different. That's why the Jews hated them so much. And he was, for lack of a better term, he was the local medicine man. He was the local witch doctor. And he did have some power, and he may have been sincere. You know, there are some people in these other pagan religions, and they, they look to the local witch doctor, he had power. And you know, it's not completely clear whether some of it was trickery or whether it was diabolical sorcery, but you can imagine what uh, he must have thought. When he's in Samaria, all of a sudden Philip shows up in town, and Philip puts up his banner and invites everybody to his meetings, and he starts to preach. These people who have all been following Simon thinking he was something great. Well, let me read one more time the introduction to Simon. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time in this same city used sorcery. And he bewitched the people of Samaria, not just this town, but all of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one. The early church fathers say that he even claimed to be divine. To whom they all gave heed. Not only did he advertise himself that way, they seem to accept it. Are there people in Hollywood that make themselves out to be really hot stuff and people then worship them as idols? And the people gave heed to him. 
from the least to the greatest, not only the poor and the uneducated, but even the wise and educated in Samaria said, Simon, he's got some connections. He's got power. Saying, this man is the great power of God. So they're thinking it's the same God. And he's evidently not telling them differently. But evidently he's using witchcraft. This was not the power of God. And they regarded him because that he had a long time bewitched them with sorcery. Now, what does the Bible have to say about sorcery and magicians? Is that something that Christians should associate with or get involved in or read about? Especially in this age where people have for years now been swept up in this Harry Potter phenomenon. I've never read a Harry Potter book. All I know is what I've learned vicariously from the media and the news talking about uh, just, I guess, the author, Rowling's, is a billionaire now because so many people have bought this book. It's about a cute little magician. And you know, so the devil often introduces something. You can get rabies from a chihuahua, you know. <laughs> doesn't have to be. It uh, doesn't have to be a Labrador or St. Bernard or Great Dane. And so the devil's introduced sorcery and he's made it cute. Oh, I used to like watching Bewitched when I was a kid. The way that Elizabeth Montgomery wiggled her little nose, you know. Or was that I Dream of Jeannie? I forget. Uh, they're old. They're both cute, right? They made the sorcery and the magic cute. Disney's, a, <laughs> Disney's got their black belt and making sorcery cute. What does the Lord say about that? Genesis 41, 8. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. Pharaoh had a dream. And he called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men. Could they interpret his dream? No, because the dream was from God and they had the power of the devil. Exodus 7, verse 11. Then Pharaoh called for the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt also did in like manner. Moses put down his rod. It turned into a serpent. With their enchantments, their sorcery. For they cast down every man his rod and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Do you see a battle of power going on here between the power of God and the power of the devil? And who has the greater power? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Deuteronomy 18.10. How does God feel about this kind of sorcery and magic power? There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. They used to offer human sacrifice to the devil. Or uses divination, divining, enchantments. Notice that it puts child sacrifice in the same category as these magical arts. And when people think that Harry Potter and these things are cute, we're really on enchanted ground because we've walked across the threshold into the other side. An observer of times. There it's not talking about astronomy, but astrology. Or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, someone who talks to the dead. For all that do these things are, this is the strongest word God ever uses for anything that's revolting to him, anything that's especially offensive to God, it is a stench in the nostrils of God. That's the word abomination. It's like something dead and stinking and revolting that makes you want to rush in the other direction. It is an abomination to the Lord. These things that are so ingrained in our culture, this magic and bewitching and reading of the palms and people telling others futures and consulting the dead and the channeling. And we are just absolutely seeped in this. And you'd be surprised how many Christians dabble in that stuff and think it's harmless. And they don't realize that they're getting on enemy ground when they do it. Daniel chapter 2. Same thing happened to Nebuchadnezzar. King has a dream. He calls for all of his wise men and his magicians and astrologers. And notice the word sorcerers and the Chaldeans to show the king the dream. 
They didn't have the power to do it. But God gave Daniel the dream and he did have the power. Now why is it important to understand and you notice Simon, the people thought what Simon had was the power of God. Could it be in the last days people confused the real power of God with sorcery? Does the devil want to confound the two and confuse the two and blur the lines? Revelation 13, 13. And he doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the side of the earth down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men to deceive. Second Thessalonians 2.9 Him, speaking of the devil, whose coming, and also this Antichrist power, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, all power and signs and lying wonders. Will the devil and the beast power have signs and lying wonders? There's lying wonders. There are wonders. God uses signs and wonders and you could say the devil's going to do some things that are wonderful, but they are lying wonders. I mean, don't we all want to see wonderful things? Well, it depends. Are they true wonders of God or lying wonders to deceive? The devil can do lying wonders. Revelation 18, verse 23. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries, speaking about the fall of Babylon, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Some people think it's just the poor uneducated classes that live out in the villages that are fooled by the witch doctors that are throwing down chicken bones and cutting up some turkey liver. That's not true. The rich men, leaders of the world, the kings were deceived. You know, you'd be shocked. There are people in Washington that check their horoscope. I think everybody remembers back in the days of Ronald Reagan, and this is not to be any kind of political statement, but I think we remember that Nancy Reagan freely admitted that she consulted astrologers and people concerned about her husband's schedule, especially after the assassination attempt. There she was looking for some power that could help protect him. And lest you think that was a political statement against Republicans, ostensibly Hillary Clinton talked to a friend who said that she could channel and put her in connection with Eleanor Roosevelt. It's amazing, people in high places that would be dabbling with these kind of things. Both claiming to be Christians, by the way. At the same time, the merchants and great men of the earth deceived by sorcery. Revelation 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. And where do they go? They go to the kings of the earth to gather them together to that battle of that great day Armageddon, that great last battle. And so here are those who are claiming to be the power of God and they're really using the power of the devil to prepare people for the end of the world using lying signs and wonders. Now back to our story. So here Philip comes into town and he begins to preach and he begins to teach and all the people gather and they're caught because, I mean, Philip was good. He eventually becomes an evangelist. He's a good communicator. He's got the power of God. Great signs and wonders are happening. He's talking and devils are being cast out. He's touching people and they're being healed. And in the audience is Simon. And he realizes, wow, this guy has got something that I don't have. This guy, I can't do. The very fact that he's come to my town and he is healing my constituents that I couldn't heal. Maybe I did a little razzle-dazzle and they felt their back pain go away for a day. Have you noticed that during some of these healing services, when they have the people line up and they come on the stage and they all declare how they were healed, Nobody shows up that was like missing an eyeball where it suddenly reappears. Nobody comes up on one leg and that other leg suddenly reappears. Or someone who has never seen before, they've been blind all their life and now they can see. There are always the gray area borderline healings. There may be people who roll up in their wheelchairs without a leg or an eyeball, but somehow they never make it up onto the platform. Have you noticed that? But Philip shows up 
And it's not the kind of healings that Simon was doing where he said, you know, your, your vision's going to improve and it seems a little better when they squint for 24 hours. You can psychosomatically feel relief in your back or your stomach. But the miracles that Philip's doing are the miracles of the first order. Like, you know, raising the dead or something like that. Simon's watching that and he goes, this is the real McCoy. I've never seen anything like this before. And he's thinking to himself, what are they going to think of me? This fella has something I don't have. He's got more power than I have. He's got more authentic power than I have. Now I think Simon, and I may be reading more into it than is there, but from, from what I read I get the impression there is part of his heart that is sincere. It says he believed. It's right there in the text. It says he believed. I mean, you can take it or leave it. Maybe he pretended to believe, but it doesn't say he pretended to believe. It says he believed. He says, this is the kind of power. I've been looking for power all my life, and he'd been using the power of the devil and maybe not even realize what he was doing. Now, I say that to you because I did that. When I first started looking for God, I was looking in all the wrong places for any kind of power. And I was dabbling in Eastern religions and I was going into this meditation where you're supposed to be able to transmigrate and all kinds of goofy stuff. Because I was looking for power and I thought the whole time it was the power of God. I got into this religion called Shakti and Silva Mind Control. And I didn't think it was of the devil. I thought I was just delving into the powers of the universe that were from God and you'd go into your lower brain levels and you would try to heal people remotely and we saw really strange things happening. It's like there was some power there. Finally when I found out about the Bible and Jesus I realized I was in the mixing up in the wrong power. So let's give Simon the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he was in that category where he was just looking for the power of God and he settled for the power of the devil. And these people believe. And you read here in Acts 8, 12, when they believe Philip and his preaching and the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, by the way, make a little note here, just trivia. Someone asked one time, is there any example where it says women are baptized in the Bible? This is one of the places where it not only says men were baptized, but it says women were baptized. I actually heard someone say one time, no men were baptized, or no women are recorded as being baptized. Simon himself believed also, and he was baptized, and he continued with Philip. You know what that means? He's following him around, and evidently the people in the town said, oh, Philip, this is Simon. He's been the great leader and a healer in the community, and he's in con connected with God. The fact that Simon's getting baptized is a great endorsement for this message. And there probably was part of Simon's heart that thinks, look, I'm losing my customers. He probably got paid for his bewitching enchantments and sorcery and magic. You can count on it. And he realizes now there's a new product in town, and I've got to stay on the cutting edge. These apostles from Jerusalem, they've got real power. I never could do anything like they're doing. They got a message. They got healing power, signs and wonders. And if you can't beat them, what? Join them. So he glues himself to Philip. And he follows him around. And he watches. He says, I want to model you. I want to learn what the secrets of the trade are. I want to be able to do the miracles you do. You know what? It almost sounds like he believed not only because he wanted to be forgiven, he wanted to be close to God, he thought, I believe because I want the power that you have. I want to do what you're doing. Now that's not all bad, but if you just want it for the power so you can use it over people, that's the wrong reason. And his motives were not pure. You know, I might say at this point, as you read through the story, we've already read it all, we know that some things about Simon were not right. And I'm encouraged to know that I'm not the only one that has baptized people that you later find out didn't have the purest of intentions. 
I've felt really bad before when folks come to you and all you can do is, I mean, you know, I can't always look for a glow or a halo over their head when they say they want to get baptized. We go through the baptismal vows. We look for the fruit of repentance in a person's life. But only God can look at the heart. And after we've applied the normal criteria and you baptize people, you sometimes find out they may have had ulterior motives. I know one fellow came to me and he just seemed to have gone through the most dramatic conversion. And when I went through the baptismal vow, I thought it was strange how quickly and thoroughly he agreed with every point. I even tried to make some things sound more difficult than maybe I did for others because I just wanted to know if I could raise any kind of reaction out of him. But it was, yes, 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 I understand, yes, yes, yes. Well, we're always happy to baptize people. So I baptized them. Later found out that he was dating an Adventist Christian who said, I will not marry you if you're not an Adventist. They got married, and he stopped showing up at church almost immediately. And I felt bad. Things like that have happened before. But I feel better when I real, realize that Philip did the same thing. <laughs> Simon came to him and said, I believe. I want the power too. His mm, belief was not pure. So they baptized him. Many were baptized. Well, they saw these people baptized in water, and the word reached the disciples in Jerusalem. The apostles were up there. A great revival is broken out in Samaria. You remember Jesus said, preach in Jerusalem and Judea in Samaria. Well, here we are. Philip is having a wonderful experience in Samaria. Thousands are being baptized. But they've only been baptized in water. And we know Jesus said, except you're born of the water and the Spirit. They need both baptisms. Apostles all got the baptism of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And evidently, now there's a whole doctrine here, and when I thoroughly understand it, I'll preach a sermon on it. I've never done it yet. But there's a doctrine called the doctrine of the laying on of hands that you find in the New Testament. Matter of fact, in Hebrews, it's listed right up there with baptism. They call it the doctrine of the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is a Bible teaching. Jesus did it. The apostles did it. Moses did it. Something was conferred through the authority of those who had been vested by Christ or ordained when they laid hands on others. And Philip evidently said, I'm a deacon. I'm an evangelist. I'm not an apostle. We need to ask the apostles to come. They recognized the authority of the apostles. Have the apostles come to lay hands on these people and pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They needed to share the Holy Spirit with the believers in Samaria through the laying on of hands. Acts 8, 14 through 16. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem, a lot of the believers had been scattered teaching and preaching, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. Why Peter and John? They're apostles. Who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he, I want to emphasize that again, there's a lot of people out there now that are telling folks that the Holy Spirit is just a force that the Holy Spirit is a thing, it's an it, it's a power. But clearly and consistently in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is identified as a person of the Godhead. All the attributes of personality are found in the Holy Spirit. Here again it says, For he, the Holy Spirit, had not fallen upon them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they came down. And they prayed over them. One by one, I suppose, they went by. They laid their hands on their head, and they received the Holy Spirit. I remember when I went to Russia, and um, we, Karen and I were there in 90, I think, had an uh, evangelistic meeting. Hundreds were baptized. They gathered at this uh, Olympic indoor pool. And it was very important to them and the pastors there they, they wanted to know, could, could I lay hands on them before the pastors baptized them? And they showed us in the Bible. They said, both are important. And so 
I thought, well, you know, there's biblical precedent for that. And so as they went down the stairs into the pool, every single person that got baptized, I stood there just like a factory inspector. I mean, it's kind of what it looked like. And everybody that went down to the pool, I laid my hands on their head and I prayed from a brief prayer because it was in English and they couldn't understand. I think actually I had a translator with me. When I went to India, hundreds, thousands, and thousands of people would come to you because I've been there twice. And they'd come up to you and they're just they're such a beautiful people. They'd go like this. I know Manji knows what I'm talking about. They'd go like this. And, and I asked my translator, I said, what do they want? They want you to pray for them. And so when they first came, I would say these long prayers. And finally my translator elbowed me. He says, you don't need to you know, say this long prayer. They just really would like you to touch their heads and bless them. And when I saw the thousands, I was relieved that that's really all they wanted because they were all lined up. And so then I got where I would just either place both hands and finally they were happy. With, they're perfectly happy. One hand. I placed my hand on the head and I remember I'd say some quick little prayer and they were just so happy. And I remember when they'd thank me, they'd always go like this. You know, we say yes, we go like this. They say yes like this. It was very confusing because I'd get a taxi and I'd say, do you know how to go to the auditorium? And the taxi driver would go like this. I go, I'd give them the address. I said, can you take me there? And they go like this. <laughs> and they say, yes. <laughs> I finally got used to that. But uh, laying on of hands was very important to them. The blessing, the touching that they would do. What did Jacob do before his, uh, he died with his sons? And with Ephraim and Manasseh, he, they laid hands on them. What did Isaac do for Esau and Jacob? So we really, I think, sometimes have forgotten something. I think it's important that uh, we still ordain people and lay hands on them. But here it wasn't just deacons being ordained or elders or apostles being ordained. Everybody that was baptized, they put their hands on them and they prayed for them. Isn't that what it says? Now Simon's watching this. And you notice that when Paul in Ephesians 19 prays and they receive the Holy Spirit, there's something that happens. They're speaking with tongues. There's evidence. They prayed and the Holy Spirit filled the place and they spoke the Word of God with power. There was some kind of manifest power that came over them when they received the Holy Spirit. It wasn't always speaking in tongues, though it was sometimes. Simon sees this happening. Maybe their faces are shining like Moses. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit came on these Samaritan believers. And he then kind of almost committed the unpardonable sin. He thought that the power was for sale. Acts 8, verse 18, And Simon, when he saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power, that on whoever I lay my hands, he might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, why do you think he wanted that power? What was he going to do with that power? He was going to go on the road and get a cash register and he was going to market the power, probably. He was going to make merchandise of it. Have you noticed how many times in the early church that capitalizing on God's power and the Holy Spirit, the devil tries to bring in a counterfeit version of the power? What was it that ultimately led to the death of Jesus? Wasn't someone making merchandise of Christ? He was sold. When Naaman was cleansed by the power of God, Gehazi wanted the silver connected with that miracle. You remember? You get several examples in the Bible of people who were confusing the power of God with, with money and trying to maybe sell it. Ananias and Sapphira, here the power of God has fallen on the church. And when the Holy Spirit fell on the church, they're selling their property, they're giving to the Lord, they're wanting to see the message spread. Ananias and Sapphira start lying about the sale of their property because of greed. Covetousness and the love of money seem to creep in right there at the beginning. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not evil. The love of it is, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith 
Now let's suppose Simon was pure, but he started thinking, boy, if I had that power, after he gets baptized, he follows Philip around. He said, I could show him how to really market this. Have there been pastors in the past and in the present that try to make merchandise of the gift of God, the power of God and salvation? We've got that Christian satellite in our home. And as I was surfing between 3ABN and Hope Channel and Amazing Facts and the different uh, Christian channels, there's also a certain channel where the pastor comes on and he starts to look dead into the camera and tell people God's word has just come to me. And I've got a message he's just given me. There are 300 Gideons out there that are supposed to give a thousand dollars a piece and God is going to release his power into your life and whatever the miracle is that you need if you plant that seed of a thousand dollars heard it just last night and I thought to myself Simon yes. <laughs> in fact there is a word that is used within church theology called Simonizing and it means when someone sells a church office to somebody else for a price. It used to be during the dark ages that you could pay to have the position of a bishop. And they called it simonizing in the church. Often he offering to buy the power of God that's only given by God. Peter uses the most powerful language that you can find in the scriptures. Acts 8.20, he said unto him, your money perish with thee because you had thought that the gift of God might be purchased. Even after Naaman was cleansed, he went back to Elisha and said, here, let me pay for it. And what did Elisha say? Not on your life. He urged him, but he refused because that was a story that illustrates cleansing from leprosy is a type of salvation and you can't pay for it. He refused. He says, you neither have part nor lot in this matter. He says, you think you're going to be one of the apostles because you're following us around. You don't understand the fundamentals. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. And giving Simon hope, Peter says, repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps, in other words, he says, perhaps there may not even be hope for you if you're thinking that you can buy the Holy Spirit. If perhaps the thought of your heart might be forgiven you. For I perceive, I detect that you're in the gall of bitterness. You know what he was saying? You're bitter that you've lost your power over these people. You're trying to get it back. You're jealous that Philip came into town and he pulled back the blinds and everybody realized you had the wrong power. That you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then Simon, the Holy Spirit, I think, is still breaking through into his mind. Simon, he said to Peter, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things that you have spoken of come upon me. You know what's interesting here? What was Peter's original name? Simon Peter. Here you've got Simon the genuine talking to Simon the counterfeit. And when they returned they testified and preached the word of the Lord and they went to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And that's where our story ends. Can we buy salvation? You know what the words of Peter actually said? I can't say in church a transliteration of what he said, but what he said is, may your silver come to destruction with you, that you would think that you could buy it. The power of Jesus, who has the real power? When you say the Lord's Prayer, how does that end? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is. Thine as opposed to who? Thine is the power as opposed to Satan who has power here. Thine is the power and the glory forever. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 6, but that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth. Well, we know the devil has power on earth. I'm so glad Jesus still has power. The Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. He told that paralyzed man, take up his bed and walk. And the people were all amazed that God had given such power to man. Christ had given that power for forgiveness. Luke 4.32, speaking of the power of Jesus, they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. 
Is there power in the Word of God? Can that power still inspire people to believe, to be washed from their sins and filled with His Spirit? And when Jesus comes, how is he coming? Luke twenty two sixty nine. 69, hereafter the Son of Man, you're going to see him come sitting on the right hand of the power of God. Do you need some power in your life? Do you want the right kind of power? Amen. I want the power of God's Spirit, that power that will help me be a witness for him. Let's not get mixed up because there's a war between two different kinds of power in the world today. And the devil wants to masquerade and counterfeit his power and pass it off as the power of God. We want the pure power of God, which really is, it's the power of love, isn't it? Amen. And that power of love is demonstrated through the power of Christ and his sacrifice and his blood. And when we understand that and we receive it, we get a blood transfusion. And we get that power in our lives. Do some of you have low blood sugar right now? Do you need an energy drink? <laughs> well, then let's pray for that living water, right? In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshiped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com 